Joining me now for another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show with the Knicks traveling back from the Pacific time zone and the West Coast to finally play a game on the better coast during a normal <laughs> sleep hour. Uh, we welcome in uh, an old rival because I don't know how much of a rivalry this is with the uh, big three now departed from uh, Brooklyn. We'll talk about all of that in just a second from the Mike Delivers podcast, as well as the fa- of the Bad Weather Fans podcast. Uh, it's Mike Misiglia. Mike, welcome back. Hey, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to uh, talking a little Nets and Knicks, and it'll be a little different. Of course, the Nets and Knicks did play each other last year once the Nets made all of those trades. But now full roster, new season, and I'm um, looking forward to dissecting and breaking down these this matchup coming up. So the state of the rivalry, let's just start there. Cause like, I've talked to you about this before. The first time that I really took Nets Nick seriously was 20, 2011, 2012, um, whichever their first year in Brooklyn was because the Knicks were good. The Nets were good. The Jason kid of it all, the Kenyon Martin of it all. That was a two seed and a four seed. There was the potential they meet up in the playoffs. And then the Knicks weren't good the rest of the decade. So there was never any right. juice behind both of them. Then 2019 happened and these last three or four years happened. And there was, of course, the like they chose them over us part right. of it. But the Knicks were still sort of figuring it out. Now all that's gone. And I'm able to just objectively watch the Nets and be like, oh, there's some some pieces I like, some pieces I have questions about. Right. And I'm I'm curious how much juice Nets fans have behind like a game against the Knicks. It's the first time they'll play this season with this iteration. How are you coming into this game? Or does it not matter? You're always looking yeah. forward to playing the Knicks. Yeah, I mean, I'm always looking forward, I think, when you're going to play the Knicks. And I think if the Nets and Knicks ever legit got really good at the same time, I do think it would be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, we have in this city, we have two teams and three teams in hockey and hockey. I won't go in as much detail, but like you look at football and you look at baseball and there's some rivalry there. And the giant jets one, for example, picked up a little bit early in the year before everything else happened. Mm -hmm. But I think when you have two teams in the same division, which isn't the case over there, I think it has the potential to be something really fun with the nets now in New York. And with, if, if they, if both teams actually got, got it together at the same time. Personally, going into this game, I always, as a fan, got really nervous when the Nets played the Knicks because of the expectations that were on the Nets' shoulders. When you have Kevin Durant, when you have Kyrie Irving, and then when you even have James Harden, there's no excuse. That's the NBA and te- things happen. But I was I always felt like if we lose to the Knicks, that's a major letdown because of the expectations on the team. I, was, I would still feel a major letdown, but I don't feel this from a fan perspective as a, as a nutcase with the Nets, like this pressure of, well, if the Nets don't beat the Knicks, it, 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 the, the, you know, the, the earth is ending. No, it's, mm-hmm. it's going to be extremely disappointing and it's going to suck and I'll have to delete my Twitter app for a couple of days because it'll be annoying. But at the same time, you know, realistically, the Knicks are one of the top tier teams in the East, not the top, not top tier. But that one stage right below and the Nets are a team kind of fighting to make the playoffs and most likely are playing team. So I understand that. Yeah, it's it's not it's not blood anymore. You're not out for blood in these matchups the way that I think <laughs> they they almost got to over the past couple yeah. of years. You mentioned yeah. the like the Jets well, giant thing was interesting because they played each other this right. year. But sure. it ended up being like a mid off to an extent because like both teams are going to end up in the top 10 in the NFL draft. Right. Most, no it thing. looks like it's funny. The Yankee Met rivalry at this point is who's going to sign this pitcher. And I think right. he's going to end up being a Dodger. So it becomes right, an exactly. offseason rivalry more than anything. You're right in Rangers Islanders. Those are two division rivals that have a long history of of just yeah. venom against and devils. Other. Oh, the Devils, too. The, the, exactly the same division. So it's actually a three team fight right. between the three of them. But with Knicks Nets, I, I, I'm telling you, it's it might have to be like a playoff matchup where the Knicks are the three and the Nets are the six. Or even if the Knicks, we'll see what happens over the, this very packed middle of the Eastern Conference. Maybe it's a play in game where these two teams are matched up seven, eight. Um, yeah. You know, is that is that a fair assessment that like maybe a playoff matchup would be what adds more I, juice back to it? I, I do think that would help, but I think it would be really great for basketball in New York. I think fans would love it. And I think there would be a healthy rivalry back and forth. I do think it eventually will get there but when the stars do align and maybe things are starting to creep that way a little bit. If you look at the trajectory of both the Knicks and Nets down the line, I mean, 
I do notice, I think Nick fans probably, and you kind of hinted at it this way, but once the, when the Nets did sign those guys, you know, you heard all of the, the responses, oh, the New Jersey Nets, oh, nobody cares. No, the Barclays Center isn't loud. They don't have any fans. And I guess there's less of that now because, to your point, they feel more ir- irrelevant. Um, so I do think there's some of that. I mean, from a Net fan perspective, I always, you know, hate being little brother. Um, you know, I <laughs> embrace it in a lot of ways too. But at the same time, like, I want to go out there and beat the Knicks so badly, you know, and, and I, I don't have any shame in that. I would say like to a, a Giants fan, do you like losing to the Eagles every week? Of course not. You want to go beat that team. So it just so happens that they're in the same city and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Uh, yeah. So for me, go out, beat the Knicks. Uh, hopefully um, both teams back East will be interesting to see, but I, it, uh, it's it, some, something juicy needs to happen. The other problem, Andrew is like Mikel Bridges and uh, Jalen Brunson, our best friends and, and Josh you know, Hart and yeah, Josh like Hart whole and, and our, crew, yeah. So it's like obviously they're going to get on the floor and you know they'll be ultra competitive, but these guys are best friends, <laughs> you yeah. know. So how how far could it really go? I guess, man, you're making a great point about the the Villanova of it all. That it just it smooths things over. With it like, does. How am I going to hate Jalen? Our best player, he uh, loves Jalen Brunson. How am I going to hate Mikael? Like Jalen Brunson, like these these are guys are roommates in college. Like these were each other's weddings over the summer. How am I going to you know muster right. up so much animosity? Whereas Kevin Durant seemed to really revel in the rivalry in the fact that he went like a whole decade without losing to the Knicks. And a lot of that had to do or a lot of that that winning happened when he was in a Nets uniform as well as well. So I'm look, I I, I went into the the the, the, four, the like, was it three year stretch, four year stretch that KD was in Brooklyn. Which includes that first year that he didn't Not play. Not playing, right? Yeah. So it's a three and a half year stretch, right? Yes. Right. I went into it with very much a rock bottom state for the Knicks, and sure. then Leon Rose, and then Thibodeau, and then what the last three years or three three and change have been, have been kind of riding the ship and just being a normal franchise. And then when the Nets showed up, there was all the, the stories of 2019. It's like, do you remember when this happened? Yeah, I know. We were told for six months they were coming here and they went sure. there instead. And yet, I don't know, like the Knicks finally exercised the demon last year of this weird Ben Simmons streak that they they had where they couldn't <laughs> right. beat Ben Simmons. Yeah. And then they also beat the Nets for the first time in a while. I almost liken it to, like I was talking to someone from a Clippers podcast, like that is clearly a Lakers town. The Clippers, like, dominated that rivalry. It was like 13 right. straight wins. And, you know, while that, it, both of those teams have like championship aspirations and the Clippers may be on their way to taking an even bigger step. Um, I think because we have the Milwaukee Boston cloud over both of us, we're just having fun over here. It's like, oh, it'll be a fun night. But at the end of the day, neither of us are going that far in the playoffs. So I wonder if that takes out of it too, you know? Yeah, and you make an interesting point from the Nick side of things because, I mean, if, as we saw last year in the playoffs, anything is possible, right? Like mm-hmm. the Bucks were the one seed. Now they've gotten reinforcements. The Celtics look unbelievable. They look unstoppable at, what, 20 and 5 right now. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I don't want to be nice to the Knicks, but I'll ha- but I have to be realistic in the front of they're good enough where if they make it and things get kind of weird, I wouldn't be stunned if they did do something. I wouldn't put them as the favorites by any stretch. I think right now they're the fourth best team in the Eastern Conference. And if I had to make a projection, it would be they lose in the second round to like the Celtics. I think that would be my honest assessment of the Knicks. Doesn't mean it was a bad year. But at the same time, I don't fully feel like, you know, Jason Tatum hasn't done it yet. Is uh, Jalen Brown really reliable in the playoffs? Kristaps Porzingis is always hurt. Now, I love the holiday edition. I think he gives them such a benefit, and I won't go full Celtic breakdown because I'm not here to do that. (laughs) But my point is, you never know. Um, And then on the net, I mean, realistically, on the net side, like, they're just average at best. Um, doesn't Doesn't mean we don't love them, but they have limitations in a lot of ways. Uh, they look great some nights. And then some nights you're like, this team's never going to win a basketball game again. They're just, they're just an average. They're just average. They're very average. Well, we'll pivot to that average team in just a second. One last follow-up question. Who are the three teams you have ahead of the Knicks? Uh, Celtics, Sixers, Bucks. So you have the Sixers ahead of them. I do. I, I think when you have Embiid playing at that level, 
I would put them ahead, but at the same time, right? You could you could make the counter argument, and you're listening to this. You're going, all right, Biseglia. Well, what have the Sixers done in the playoffs? How has Joel Embiid performed? They don't have James Harden anymore. Do you trust Tyrese Maxey to take a jump up in this set? Ty- Tobias Harris is getting old. Like you could make all these arguments, so I get you there. Um, I just think based on the Embiid factor of his dominance, I'd put them fourth in the Eastern Conference. But again, I'm not like, oh, they don't have any chance to beat the Sixers. Hell yeah, they uh, can do it. So I. So here's the pushback, and it's not even necessarily like the, the Sixers. Their their data so far this year, they're second in offense, they're number one in net rating, like better than the Celtics. My uh, the KFS listeners have heard me opine about this the last couple days, but I'm like getting very annoyed at the Sixers' schedule. Like the Knicks, and mm-hmm. you can even relate to this with the road trip that the Nets just went it's on. Been tough. It's been brutal. Every team I've talked to, every pregame podcast I've done, the Lakers schedule is brutal. The Clippers schedule is brutal. Everybody's schedule has been brutal, except the 76ers. They missed the play-in tournament and got an extra game against Washington and an extra game against Atlanta. Their following games were Washington again, Detroit twice, Charlotte. Like They finally played a better than been, than awful team last night, and they lost it home to the Bulls. Like, at a certain point, I just want to see them play like a, a tough road trip or right. a good three week stretch where not everybody is ass, you know. So I that that's my pushback on Philly. If they suddenly we look up in February and they're still number one in net rating, then it's tough to argue against. I just I have I have a very especially with how frustrating the Knicks schedule has been. They played twenty road games already. Wow. Like I, I'm at the point where I just I want to see them actually go through a fire before I fully fully crown them but if they're, you go by the by the record and by the net rating they absolutely are one of the top three teams and, in the conference and, and as my friend kenny smith would say they you know they've got the best player on the court or whoever it was from tnt if i'm butchering it it wasn't a reference there it was about the, yeah, oh, they would the, have the, the best player on the court i see what you're just saying they would have the best player on the court in a series against the yes, Knicks. they would um we've seen what that player has done in the postseason in Nothing. the past which dog poo you know may not matter in a series against the knicks but i dog don't know poo. how much that says about us with julius randall which Ugh. i'm sure that'll come up throughout this conversation so let's talk about your team the the, the brooklyn nets the they're the 16th in net rating looking at it they're um 21st in defense, but 11th in offense. They're coming off a stretch where they've lost four out of five and going through it. It's it's a tough game against Denver, um, a blowout game against Denver, a tough loss against uh, Golden State. And then Knicks fans know all about this, a pretty annoying loss against Utah. Yeah. So how are the vibes in Brooklyn at the moment? There's been stretches where I've looked up and I'm like, oh, the Nets are, are th- 13 and 10. They're they're toward the, the middle of the pack in the East. This is this is a team we have to worry about. And then this stretch happens. And now I'm 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 curious. So you tell me how are the vibes in Brooklyn? Yeah, I mean, the Nets were feeling good after their homestand where they went six and one or seven and one with a road game split in there, but it was an easy it was an easier road game in Atlanta that they won on a Mikel Bridges uh jumper with about three seconds left. They go out well. West and they don't play very well, right? They 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 do get the win in Phoenix, which they lose in Sacramento. They they win in Phoenix. Then they have back to back against Denver. So similar to the Knicks loss in the Clippers, where you're just like, we're playing a hot team on a back to back, sort of a schedule loss. You kind of mm-hmm. get that. Warrior lost awful. Um, they were down early. They come back. They have many chances to win. Steph Curry goes beast mode. And it's a reminder to net fans. We don't have superstars. They do. And then they see the Utah Jazz. And that's the game. You're like, all right, if we can get this win, we're two and three on the road trip with a lot of difficult games. You feel a lot better about going home. They're up five at the half and they just lay an egg versus Utah. And the biggest problem for the Nets Mikel Bridges was brutal in this stretch. In the five mm-hmm. games, he averaged 16.6 points per game. He shot like 37% from the field. His defense was terrible yesterday versus Colin Sexton. He even admitted it. Uh, Cam Johnson, who just got paid $100 million, has been not living up to his contract. I mean, he has been an okay role player, but when you're out, when you're paying somebody $100 million, you're expecting more than seven points one game, 11 the next, uh, 16, 8, 12, whatever that stretch is. That has been massively disappointing. And a big part of the Nets stretch on these losses, there's two bench players they did not have on this road trip, and you could see that they were sorely missed. Lonnie Walker the fourth, who's been averaging 16.6 for, per game off the bench, and a guy that you guys are familiar with, Dennis Smith Jr., who's been mm-hmm. really 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 good for this team they really missed those two guys and you could see the impact on the court 
was a huge problem for the Nets as their lack of energy. These two helped provide that for this team. One shining star for them, and he has been tremendous, is Cam Thomas. And I had Nick fans yesterday reach out to me and go, well, I haven't really watched the Nets, but I saw the box score. And every time Cam Thomas seems to score, the Nets seem to lose. If you watch the game yesterday, let me tell you this. They would have lost by 40 if Cam Thomas was not in that game. He scored 32 points, 20 came in the second half, and he was the only person that was able to hit open shots. He's been great for them. Um, he is a budding star, young player that you feel good about, maybe as an asset down the line for a superstar. But that's a big problem when Bridges stinks, Cam Johnson stinks, and your bench is depleted. They laid an egg all over the West Coast. So it's fascinating that you bring up Cam Thomas because that was the next thing I was going to ask you about. Because I, yeah. I see the I see the splits. He's averaging 24, 3 and 2 this year. Really good score. His his shooting numbers, he's having 46 from the field, 38 from three, 85 from the line. Those are those are very good shooting splits. I would kill for yeah. RJ to average that in a season, right? Which he is shooting sure. 85% from the line, so he'll take it. But then you go to his lineup data. And when he's on the court, they're being outscored by five points per hundred possessions. And that's in 1,100 possessions. And then when he's off the court, they're outscoring the other team by six points per hundred possessions. That's almost 1,400 possessions. So to, to summarize all that, it's basically what I'm reading from this is all courtesy of cleaning the glass is that they're actually better with him off the court. But you're painting a picture where it's like they don't have a chance when he's off the court. So what's what's that connecting there? Well, well, first of all, I feel like I'm on a on a debate, and like my um, person, me, you know, like make next, it clear. It, it, we're talking to hoops here, you know. Yeah, I'm not next to me, to is like, well, yeah. well, let me let me let me say that, and then I'm like, oh no, I wasn't prepared for that. No, I'm just having fun. Well, no, like some um, of that can be misleading. Yeah, like it depends no, on who's I, I on the court just, with you. So I'm just I wanted to make sure. Course. Like, no, what, what am I missing? Yeah, no, I'm just being silly. Like for yesterday, for example, we'll look at last night. Nobody was hitting shots outside of him. He was on the floor and helping them in so many ways, even defensively, that he could go out there, get buckets. Um, I don't have a defense. of your. I, I honestly don't have an answer for that. If it's going to look at the data and say when he's off the court, I don't, I, I don't know. I, but I can just tell you from the eye test of watching every single Nets game outside of the Sixers on a Sunday when they lost by 20 because I had to go to a wedding. I would tell you his flow of the offense is different than in the past. In years past, it's been getting the ball, get out of the way. He's part of the offense. Now, you might say maybe th maybe the recent Bridges and Cam Johnson aren't functioning as well is when he's out there, they take a back seat, and that could lead to some of that. That might be the answer. Uh, but far as just watching him on a day-to-day -day basis, um, he makes the team go. He gives the Nets a scoring option. And you feel secure when he's there and he's taking a leap up that he's helping this team win basketball games. I don't I, I can't give you an answer why when he's off the court at this and he's off is you know when he's there is that, you know, I'll we'll look at schedule, for example. When he was hurt, he was out for um a handful of games. The net schedule in the middle of the season was stinky poo. So there could be a correlation to that as well, right? The Nets racking up wins versus the Wizards, versus the Hawks, versus uh, poor teams in the East could have something to do with that as well. Um, with the Pistons coming up, by the way, and I know the Nets are going to lose that game. Uh, oh, but I, think I, they, have, they have them twice, right? Are you actually yeah, worried about that? 100% they're going to lose one of those. Oh, man. That's, a, that's a lock. But yeah, no, I mean, he, he has done everything to advance and play better basketball. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy he's on the team and he's 22, 22 years old. So I'll throw him a bone real quick. I rewatched because the Knicks were playing the Suns Nets. I watched the second half of the game um, when the, when Brooklyn played Phoenix. And yeah. um, so the Knicks were playing the Suns next. And I wanted to, to get a feel for how Phoenix was playing. And the player that stood out on the Brooklyn end was Cam Thomas, specifically that fourth yeah. quarter where I believe he had 10 points in was part of them erasing what was a tough third quarter. So th the in inflection of offense is, is clearly um, yeah. injection of offense, excuse me, is clearly uh, seen when he's there. I guess how do Nets fans feel about him long-term with like, you mentioned him being a, a piece in the future, potentially for a trade. I just, from my perspective, he seems like a sixth man that comes in and it's just like, Oh, instant offense. We needed a bucket. 
how did how did Nets fans really feel about him? Yeah, I don't. I definitely don't think he's a six man. And I was advocating for him to start the season and wanted Dinwiddie to come off the bench. They had a different really? point. They had a different okay. point. They had a different point guard then who hasn't played in a couple of weeks. But Whatever that is. But he he's got to be part of the offense and in the starting rotation. Um, he he's just that good of a player. I don't, I think he's more than somebody that comes off the bench, heats up, gets you a bucket. I, I like him as part of that starting rotation and give the Nets some flexibility offensively, especially when the guy, the likes of Mikel Bridges aren't playing as well. And with the Nets depth now with, if they're back, Lonnie Walker, for example, and Dennis Smith Jr., they've got de- uh, bench pieces. So I feel, I feel um, secure about that. I think Nets fans either are in love with him and they say he's the greatest player since Kobe Mm-hmm. Or ship him out. You got to trade him. Everything is um, fake numbers. I, I don't know why it can't be somewhere in between leaning towards he's good. He's 22 years old. He keeps taking a leap. And Jacques Vaughn didn't play him the last couple of years because he didn't have faith in him and everything else that he could do defensively, move the ball. That is all gone. He's getting minutes. He's getting a lot of minutes. The coaching staff relies on him. They need him. Now, with that said, if a super duper star is coming along, I'm listening. I'm very much listening. I'm not a net fan that's going to sit there and tell you, hey, you can't, he's untradeable, right? If there's a piece there that makes more sense for the future of the team, you go ahead and do it. But uh, Cam Thomas is the brightest part of an average season so far for the Nets that he went from, will he even play minutes to, you're going to need him to score baskets and you're going to need him to win games. Look, look, there's... There's players like this that are polarizing in every fan base. I, yeah. I mean, I'm sure through your multiple conversations with Knicks fans that you've heard the the RJ Barrett conversation, even sure. overheard the RJ Barrett conversation happen. Um, you mentioned the 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 trade package potentially if a superstar is available, and through scrolling through your tweets because we obviously follow each other on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, the Mitchell news hit you the same way it hit a lot of Knicks fans. Where it's like, oh, he's available. I wonder what how how we could get him on our team or potentially get him on our team. So, what's the trade package you're comfortable with? I think it's it's Cam Thomas, some salaries, and a bunch of draft picks. I think that's the most realistic. Uh, and I I would say you know Cleveland's played better even with the losses that they had. They they got to win. They got to win versus Houston. Um, but I think it's the most unkept secret in the league that Donovan Mitchell doesn't want. Donovan Mitchell's not going to be like, I'm going to be a Cav for life. Of course not. He wants to go somewhere else. He wants to have a chance to win. I know about his, everybody knows about his connections to the Mets, mm-hmm. and which, which makes the obvious connections to the teams in New York. If I, if he had, if he had honest serum and had to p- pick between the two, I bet he would pick the Knicks. But at the same time, I don't think he's anti Nets. He's best friends. I don't say best friends. He's very good friends with Mikel Bridges on the team. I think you'd like it. I think you'd be into the vibe and playing for the Brooklyn Nets. That's the package I think I'd be most comfortable giving up is some form of Thomas salary dump and the draft picks. And I think you need to give a little to get back. When we see all these mock trades, you're like, ah, I'll give you my ham sandwich from three weeks ago and my leftover lasagna. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to actually have some assets that the other team would be semi interested in. Um, so that's what I feel comfortable with. And, you know, I definitely think the Nets, once they get there, uh, have a potential chance to land them. So let's, let's ask the question a different way now. Who's the untouchable in a Donovan Mitchell trade for you? Probably, I mean, it's Mikel. Like it's he's Mikel not going, and that's it. Like, that's is probably, oh yeah, that's it. I mean, Nick. I mean, the thing is, Nick is a free agent, and he's he's a weird player, man. Because like, he's so good defensively. He, mm-hmm. he just because he's he's not a big guy like thick, but he is. I'd like to be clear, Nick uh, Claxton is who you're referring to yeah, to the Knicks uh, fan that that is unaware who you're talking about. Sorry, yeah. and yes, and what I do love about when the net and Knicks play each other is then everybody kind of gets to see the other team a little bit more mm-hmm. in depth and sees it through a different lens. But Nick Claxton, I don't know if he's first in the league in blocks. I mean, he's such a good shot blocker in the way that he gets to the basketball. Um, and the thing about him that's the most special to me, even beyond the blocks, is if you put him in a pick and roll set, he can go out and guard guards. He can get out on the perimeter and he's not a liability where you're like, oh boy, here here comes that first step. No. That doesn't happen with him. Offensively, he can finish around the rim. He's got a little bit better of a touch. He hit a three earlier, but he still has some limitations in how the offense flows with him around. So uh, giving up Cam and Nick 
Claxton for is, is for someone like Donovan Mitchell is probably too much. Um, you're giving up too much of the foundation. Uh, but I would say right now it's it's probably Mikael Bridges is the only person that will not that is on this roster for the long long term. I think everybody else is is uh, you know realistically on is is can can be had. Yeah, I think if I were if I were a Nets fan to put myself in in that perspective, the idea would be like get Mikael with. Donovan and then let's let's go to work. Let's build around that, you know. Right. And that it's funny. I was talking to someone from the Cleveland perspective, and his thought was like, well, like Mikhail or Hero. That's like whoever the the headliner of that trade is, whoever's willing to give either one. No, and I was like, I don't think Nets fans are gonna give up Mikhail in a trade no. like that. So um and look, we it it honestly is gonna depend, I think, when the trade happens because if there's an immediacy at the deadline this year, then I think it could just be going to the best offer. But if this goes to the summer when Donovan might have a little more say, he's only got one more year left of control. So they, they might be able to get his pre agency, uh, 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 underway ahead of time where it's like, you got one more year. We'll see what offers we can get on the table. Um, but we'll see. I, I obviously from a Knicks perspective, we went through this last summer sure. and, it, it ended with him not coming here to re-enter that conversation. Knowing what oh. I know now about the roster is is very conflicting, but obviously I think they'll have a chance in, in potentially nailing oh, him. Oh, 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 and I would love more than anything because I hear it still all the time. Mm-hmm. How could the Nets even have a chance at Donovan Mitchell? Like, why would he go there? And I'm I, I'm always saying I they definitely have a chance. Superstars like going to the Nets. I'm not saying it works out. I'm not saying I'm not saying that. But like Damian Lillard is on the record of saying I would go to the Nets. He didn't say the Knicks. So this idea that Donovan Mitchell wouldn't want to somehow go there, I think, is foolish. So for me, it would be because winning a title so down the line and just pockets of enjoyment mm. to see Donovan Mitchell go to the Nets and join Mikel Bridges and seeing the Knicks fail again to acquire him would, would truly on uh, any, on a uh, playful level. No, it's part of it. No, it would I get it. It's part of it. It would, yeah. be, it would be like at, at some point, you, when will you get it? That this is a thing that happens. Yeah. And I, and I always say this, the Nets aren't the Knicks of popularity. They don't have the history that the Knicks have. They don't have the foundation that the Knicks have. So my dad was a Knicks fan. His dad was a Knicks fan. I get that. But at the same time, like they still are there and they still are building something. So both can be true at the same time. I will, uh, for, whatever, for whatever my say so matters, I will echo the sentiment that if you're a Knicks fan and you're dismissing Brooklyn as a Donovan Mitchell destination, I would just remind you of what happened in 2019, which was my humbling because I was I was that dismissive about how Katie and Kyrie were not going to choose Brooklyn. And right. then lo and behold, they chose Brooklyn. So that was the ultimate humbling. And going forward, it's like, yeah, they're, the Nets are in play. That's a destination. That's the a biggest takeaway from that that big three era for Brooklyn is like it may not have ended in the ultimate goal of a championship, but forever. I can't just be like, if a star wants to choose New York, they'll choose the Knicks because it's another team I at least have to consider that they'll go to. Uh, and not that it worked. Like the Knicks might be better off because it didn't happen. I mean, I can tell Different you. Different conversation. First, You're right. First, yeah. First hand experience. Kyrie Irving with the Nets over the last three years, a lot of things happened that were bizarre, mm-hmm. crazy, <laughs> and everything else in between. So it wasn't exactly like, oh, this was a fun experience. Not true. Uh, I'm just telling you that they did come here, and it was uh, the biggest failure in you know in basketball history, really, um, with with Ooh. expectations of stars like that. It's 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 it was terrible. Um, it was it was it was terrible. You know, it's funny if you go to biggest failures in basketball history. I wonder if if the Clippers are. It's funny they both involve James Harden. The Clippers, if they don't win a title, may have to maybe in competition for that, you know? Because they, yeah. especially when you look at what Shea Gill just Alexander's become. Yeah, you know? yeah. The Clippers are a little bit older. I mean, Har- I mean, Harden was 
you know, doing snow angels versus the Pacers yesterday, but Mm -hmm. they're a little bit older with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard at the end of their careers. And now, you know, Harden a few more years. He's not, they're not the same players. So when you look at KD was playing at an unbelievable level, he almost beat the bucks by himself. Then you had Kyrie in his prime, Harden just slightly out of his prime as the third wheel. Like, (laughs) um, you know, there was a lot of things that went wrong from injuries to egos to narcissistic behavior uh, that all, you know, stirred up, uh, turned into the the new nets they have now when it yeah. like, came back out. Which, look, I would be, you, you talk about pockets of enjoyment. I think the reason that a Donovan Mitchell traded, from my perspective, because I don't, like if the nets get him, in fact, I, I believe I said when we had a, we did a Utah pod last week and I said, I, I, from our belief amongst the, the KFS circle is like Brooklyn probably should be considered the favorite to get him, if not Miami, because I, I don't think the Knicks are in pockets of enjoyment mode. We're enjoying our pockets of winning at the moment. The next move has to be a step toward a contender. Yes. And I don't know if Mitchell, while he's outstanding and that offense would be unreal, there are just several defensive questions I have, especially in a playoff series with that backcourt of Brunson and Mitchell. Um, however, while the Nets seem to have a lot of players that I'd, I'd enjoy watching, like you mentioned Cam Thomas, Mikael Bridges, um, Cam Thomas, on uh, Cam Johnson on yeah. certain nights, and the, the, the revelation that Dennis Smith Jr. has been since he really saved his career and committed himself to defense. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't want to bring down the pod too much and talk about Ben Simmons. And I just, what's what, what happened? Uh, uh, He played six games and then hasn't played like the last time he played a basketball game, the, the Pistons losing streak was at four. So it's been a while. And I'm yeah. I'm just curious what happened because it looked like he was playing well to start the year. So where are we with, with Ben Simmons? Yeah, he was, he was playing well. Like, I, that version of Ben Simmons would have been really good for the Nets. Like you have to mm. look at it. We'll go back to that point. You know, people are like, that's the guy he was and he's getting paid $35 million. Yeah. He is drastically overpaid for the player that was performing to start the season. But I would just say, if you remove the contract, because you have to, in, in this sense, because it's not like he's Ben Simmons, the superstar who's underachieving. He's just, out there, you're like, okay, this guy can rebound, he pushes transition, and he helps the Nets in transition baskets. Is he great? Of course not. Is he terrible? No. He's a part of it. He's a rotation player on a team that's playing well, and that's all that he is, and that's all that you take him for. Problem is, he can't even do that. I don't know what's going on with his back and everything that happens with it from from injury. Um, I think anybody that's when I went into the offseason, I said, if we could just get what we were getting, I'd be thrilled with it. But you know, there's going to be something that pops up. It always happens. I don't think there's one net fan out there now watching that's, you know, not these Ben Simmons stands. He's not even a thought in net fans' minds. It's like he's mm-hmm. not even on the team. I think at this point, I'd be shocked if he ever plays for the Nets again. And he's just like when I mentioned they went on the the West Coast trip and I was like, they really missed Lonnie Walker and Dennis Smith Jr. I could feel their presence missed. It didn't even occur to me to bring up Ben Simmons in the conversation. And that wasn't me making a point. I legit didn't think it because he's so, just not on my mind or part of this team. When someone asks you about Ben Simmons, like I just did, is it like when I get a Evan Fournier question? Like yeah. It's just like not even part of the right. calculation. He's for done. This team. Right. Exactly. He. I don't know if it's phys- it's physical, mental, whatever it might be. He's just not part of it. He's not there. And I think net fans now, this is their roster. This is where they're going forward. Um, and it's not even you know, like, like, like the Cam Thomas conversations. Why is Mikel Bridges struggling? What do the Nets do about Nick Claxton? Like these are the topics that net fans are immersed in, but Ben Simmons now, and it's unfortunate because he was playing well and was contributing to this team. It was still the same problems. Like he's scared to go to the basket. What do they do in the fourth quarter? Do you bench him? But that you can't even have that conversation anymore. He's, 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 he's irrelevant to net fans. I, I'm not surprised because I will say I, those first four games made me just perk up. Like, Oh, let me see. Let me see what this is. You know, this is this seems to be yeah. a guy that might be finding a home. Like we always thought, even when he when he was with Embiid, that he needed his own team where 
field goal attempts weren't going to be counted and, and points were going to be counted. He just needed to run an offense, right. you know? And um, I guess we'll see if if his next destination, he's just able to stay on the court, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's where we're trending right now with, with, with Ben Simmons, you know? Yeah, if you were to take what he has to start the season, you're like, yeah, this this is a guy that contributes to our roster. I like I like what he's giving. I you know it'd be like a different kind of player tremendously, but I would say like Josh Hart. You know, you're not like mm. you're not just like a very different guy, but to the point of like, yeah, he's part of this team. He if he's out, you're like, damn, I I wish he was there, right? But at the same time, you're not like he's gonna make or break. The, he just he just he violently overpaid. But that yeah. that's kind of like contribution level, I would say, what Ben Simmons was giving, but which was good compared to what it was in the past, where contribution level was, you know, dressing up like Blippy, the TV star, looking on the sidelines. Like it was bad, man, you know? So now you'll see him, you'll see him. I'm sure he'll be at the Nick game because there'll be a lot of people watching. And, you know, the Nets, the Nets owe us an update though on him as well. Let me reference that. It's mm. been the two week mark. So I'll, I expect some news on that hopefully soon, at least. So it's something that they tell us. You know what I mean? I think every parent out there will appreciate the blippy reference that she just that she just dropped on the pod. Unfortunately, I'm not part of the club just you yet. Don't know blippy, man. Don't worry I, about it. I have so many friends that there's two blippies, that, by the way. There's two blew blippies. My, blew my mind. Yeah, I could, could go deep in that. There's two blippies. I but was only different. aware of one blippy. Hold it's on a second. Just, yes, two blippies. I, I actually do it. I'll, I'll plug myself. I do another podcast about I review kids TV shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do it with another guy and we like BS about what the crap our what the crap our kids are watching. So I've kind of made a lot of discoveries about blippy. I well, when the day comes in the future, everybody that wants yeah. to put children in my life in the future <laughs> i will be subscribing to that podcast I thank you. you i appreciate uh it. three things before i let you get out of here i ask these three questions to every single guest that joins me at least i've Was started there. to ask three questions so i have a theory that every fan base has a player that the coach doesn't play enough or they believe the coach doesn't play hmm. enough who is it on the nets wow, that's an interesting question this season I was looking at Dayron Sharps on off, and I was like, oh, "Okay, he seems gonna, to have have some good numbers." Dude, I'm pulling up a. Go ahead, go ahead. This is a weird year because they play a little bit of everybody because they're just average, and everybody has to play. So I do want to bring up. Okay, well, Harry Giles gets a lot of that, but because of the development that Dayron Sharp has taken, that subsided a little bit. Jalen Wilson might be the guy. He's their rookie out of Kansas. He got a little run last night, so fans have wanted him out there more. But it's more of a complaint, I think, for this team that they just don't have what they used to have on a talent scale. Mm. Um, So I would say those two guys, but they're kind of manufactured, and it's not real. Like In years past, it was easy. If this was last year, it'd be Kim Thomas. End of of discussion. Like Not even a second. Uh, But this one, it's like, those guys, but it's um, it's more, it's more disappointment that Cam Johnson's getting minutes, play him less. Oh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's I know that's kind of a bad answer, but it's I think it's the honest one. That is a que- that is part of the question, I guess, is the the minute distribution question of that. There, are, there's there's players, whether it be too many or too little, yeah. that the coach is not doing the right thing. I maintain that every fan base has that, and oh, I have not yeah. gotten a no answer yet. So that it's, that exists. It's fun. Um, it's fun for fans on that one because all fans know more than their coaches. We all Clearly. Know yes, absolutely. Although I, I just, I mean, you quickly should play more, but that's... Yeah, a, no, I agree. I, I agree with you. Um, the second one, the Mount Rushmore of rivals. Now, obviously, mm. the, the Knicks fall on your Mount Rushmore, but I... Yeah. I Liking it that the the day the NBA calendar comes out, we all have those dates we circle, and the the Knicks. I'm going to. I mean, we've talked about it at the top. The Knicks are one that you circle. Who are the sure. other three on your personal yeah. Mount Rushmore? See, this is an interesting year for the Nets with this. So this year and this year alone, I'll go Clippers, I'll go Mavs, and I'll go Suns. <laughs> Well done it because of the three, the the former big three. So Which they beat, that must have been really sweet the other night, beating KD the first it was. time that Mikel went to Phoenix. It was. They beat Phoenix. They beat the Clippers, which was the game after the Knicks beat the Clippers. So they weren't where they were yet um, mm-hmm. at home at Barclays. And then the Mavs game, which was the second game of the year, they were up like six with two minutes left. 
And Luka Doncic hit Luka. One, of the, <laughs> one of the most bu- effed up shots I've ever seen. He like just threw it over his head and hit a three. He was like, oh, all right. Um, so they were so close to completing the trifecta. Normally, though, it'd be, it would be Sixers, Celtics, Knicks, um, and Bucks probably get on my mm. nerves. Yeah, that makes sense. The that Luca game, I remember that happened, oh, and it God. made me look up his his uh, MVP oh, odds. Like, let me just look at this to see where he is. And unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't jump on it, but it was like he was terrible. He's where he's normally been. It's been top five odds like throughout his career. <sighs> um, and then the last one, we've talked about the Knicks a ton, but I like to hand over the pod to my my guests before they leave if they have a Knicks overarching thought or opinion or question about this season or the state of the Knicks. So uh, last word, Mike, your thoughts on the New York Knicks. I'm sure you've done I've, plenty of thinking about the Knicks over yeah, the course of your life. I've got, okay, I will ask you a question. Sure. Do you think that this version of Julius Randle will be able to go to the playoffs this year and sustain it or will have his typical terrible postseason because he has been on a tear lately in his last 11 games or whatever the stat is. And at Nick, whatever, who's listening can correct me, but I'm curious <laughs> um, if, if Nick fans believe that he'll actually get it together or, you know, just like a lot of stars in New York can't handle the bright lights when it matters most. So there's two different questions you just asked and it's, do I believe that this version of Julius Randle is sustainable? And to to give out the full stat line, so it's his last 20, because that first six stretch, the first six games where he got off to maybe the worst start in NBA history the, for a high-volume player. Um, since then, it's 20 games. He's averaging 25-9-5 and five on 51% from the field and uh, 33% from three, but he's taking less threes this year. Honestly, a 34% three point shooter on four attempts is fine. And then just below 80% from the free throw line. He's been all NBA good these past 20 games. Um, I think this version of Julius Randle is regular season sustainable because I've seen it be regular season sustainable. It remains matchup dependent for me on who they play in the okay. playoffs. I think he'd be good against Tobias Harris in a series. I think he'd be good against, I mean, Atlanta. He usually destroys when he plays them. Um, I do think if he plays Cleveland again, Evan Mobley is going to give him trouble. Or if he plays the Heat, Bam Adebayo is going to give him trouble. Right. So it, it becomes matchup dependent come playoffs. Uh, the other question that you that you kind of asked was like, do Knicks fans believe? And there is a very vocal portion of Knicks fans that these numbers that he's putting up now mean nothing. That he can... Like the, the like you mentioned, the eleven game stretch is even better than the twenty game stretch, and it's like yeah, whatever. Like we've we've seen regular season Julius sure. be this, and I've done my best to try and balance it. That because I have an expectation for the Knicks to just make the second round, and I'll be happy. Um, even if it's just like a competitive first round series, it'll be disappointing. But like I will have enjoyed that journey. I'm trying to enjoy the Julius Randle experience because of where he's starting to place himself in Nick's history. Like he's climbing up so many leaderboards at the moment that, you know, he's the guy that can get you from a laughing stock to respectability. And maybe if another failed postseason comes up, maybe he's not the guy that can get you from respectability to, you know, contending. Um, so I have a soft spot for Julius. There is a vocal portion of the fan base that will never have the the same appreciation nice. for him, which is like you said, it comes with the territory of the city he plays in. Yeah. You got to do it when it matters most. And I think for him, unfortunately, like you alluded to, if you're going to continue to fail at the biggest spot, mm-hmm. um, you will hear it from a very passionate and, you know, championship hungry fan base. <laughs> Can we also just be a, a playoff hungry fan base though? Like you know this better than anybody. We have not made the playoffs a lot. We have not made the playoffs in no. a row a no. lot. And if they do it this year, it'll be the first time they made the playoffs in back to back season since Mello. Like, I don't know. I'm I'm at the point because of the the they don't have, I believe, a championship caliber team that if this season ends in a second round exit to Boston or Milwaukee, I'll be like, you know what? That's a well, that's I guess. A, 
time well spent season. You know, I guess the problem is, and a question would would be, you know, to Leon Rose if he listens, what are you going to do to become that step? You've done a nice job going from terrible, dysfunctional, embarrassing to, as you alluded to earlier in the episode, a, you know, well run, respectable franchise. What are you doing? to make this team a championship contender because at the end of the day, that is his job. That's mm-hmm. what he's paid to do. Now we don't hear from him. So, you know, who knows? <laughs> and we never will. And we never will. <laughs> what are you doing to make that happen? Are you helping that Jalen Brunson who fell in your lap gets even better? Do you want Julius Randle to have big playoffs? Like what is the plan? Leon? Yeah, I think my answer to that question would be, be I've been more fascinated with the moves he hasn't made like the plan is to be patient you know like they didn't make a move when they could have last offseason whether it be overpaying and forcing their hand at an Ananobi trade because like Ananobi still available um getting in on the Drew Holiday sweepstakes um there's rumors that Carl Anthony Towns was available that the Knicks decided they'd rather run it back with Julius um you know, I, 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 I'm more fascinated with the thought that the guys that I believe he was saving all his chips for are slowly coming off the table with the way Embiid, as you mentioned, has been playing so far this year with what the Clippers are. So like the Paul George ship might have sailed. If you did want to pivot to Cat, Carl Anthony Towns, that ship might be sailing with what the Timberwolves are doing this year. Um, so when you look up and like your your biggest targets are no longer there, then then what the will all will the move even be available to make? So um, we'll see. I, yeah. I I'm enjoying the pockets of good, as you mentioned it though, the pockets of enjoyment well, at the moment. And I, I guess we can see if it continues in this matchup against Brooklyn. Um, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Uh, no, I just you know I I appreciate you having me on. I did want to you know just let people allude to and let them know um, that. Bad Weather Fans, the basketball podcast that I do. I'm a Nets fan, obviously, as you alluded to this. Um, do it with a Knicks fan at Nick Central, Alex B. And our uh, we are which we are recording um, after our game on what the Nets Knicks game on Wednesday night, which is our 200th episode. There we go. Uh, so um, <laughs> you know, if you listen or not, just super proud that we've done 200 episodes. Uh, we've had some really cool guests, and um, as you know. Um, and, and, and I know you can respect this because I respect all the hard work and great content that you, um, and the rest of the team does putting out all those episodes. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of prep. Um, a lot that goes on beforehand, post-production emails, guest booking tweets, social media clips. Um, there's a lot that goes out to make it great. So I'm super proud of that. Um, you know, and, and to share that success means a lot. Yeah. The, the milestone of a hundred episodes is is worth celebrating. So even more so, two hundred is yes. worth celebrating. So congrats, thank uh, you on on that milestone. Uh, it's the only congrats I will be giving you over the next twenty four hours. Because if the the Knicks lose to the Nets, I will not Ugh. be congratulating. I'm gonna be you, in but... <laughs> such a bad mood too. I hate. I mean, I hate losing to the Knicks, and mm-hmm. I hate losing to the Knicks at the Barkley Center too. Like nothing. Nothing gets me more annoyed. And that, that all stems from when I was a little kid and had to go to Nets games and listen to Nick fans take over my arena. Not I am not. This is something for a conversation with a professional, but man, that has worn me down, man. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, I was one of those Knicks fans that couldn't afford tickets to the garden. I, I get it. We right. took trips to the eyes on well, center. And it's like, oh, what do you know? The the Knicks affordable Knicks tickets are just a burden. I get it. Across That's the what... Hudson away, you know. We were net fans. Ten minutes away. This is what it costs. Okay, we get to see Jordan. We get to see Malone. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Right. See, you're hinting on this the, the secret that a lot of Knicks fans or just NBA fans found out. First time I saw LeBron James was at the Izod Center. First yeah. time I saw the big three, the Kevin Garnett big three, uh, was at the Izod Center. The Nets tickets yeah. being what they were compared to the Garden. And the first time I, the, the moment my buddies and I knew how to drive, it was like, mom, can we borrow the minivan? We're going to go drive to Jersey because like Kobe's in town, you know, like yeah. that, that became the thing to do when, at least when I, when I was concerned, we, I was 18, 19, 20, you know, we had season tickets and I would uh, okay. tell you the, the, the Nets Lakers NBA finals game three, this was seventh row mid left center court, $150 a ticket. Oh my god! Seventh gosh. row. 
Kobe, Shaq, NBA Finals. Like, I promise you, whatever you think about the Barkley Center, Nick fans, seven throw NBA Finals game. If LeBron was there, if uh, Dal- whoever was there, it would be more than one hundred and fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. Crazy, just 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 a bit, just a bit. Uh, Mike, as always, good to talk to you. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me.